بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ڈیئر ویورز السلام علیکم آئی ایم یو ہوز فیصل رضا خان اینڈ یو آر واچنگ فور سائٹ ویورز انڈین اوشن از ون آف دا بزیسٹ ٹریڈ کاریڈور ود اپروکسیمیٹلی فور ففتھ آف دا ورلڈ آئل اینڈ گیس شپمنٹس اینڈ ون تھرڈ آف دا بلک کارگوز پاسنگ تھرو اٹ اٹ از کائنڈ آف اے جنکشن اینڈ آلسو ہوز سم آف دا چوک پوائنٹس لائک اسٹریٹ آف ہرموس اسٹریٹ آف ملاکا اینڈ آلسو گیو passage and join Pacific Ocean with the Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea through the Suez Canal as well. Pakistan's more than $10 billion of uh, worth of uh, energy lifeline linked with Gulf and also 95% of the trade uh, is uh, dependent on this important ocean which is called the Indian Ocean. Pakistan exchange volume is growing with the growing population. And in that case particularly, it is very important that the sea lanes of communication, uh, to which we also call the sea lines of communication, that uh, they must have to be very safe and secure. And for that matter, the robust uh, trade shipping and also a strong navy is a prerequisite and inevitable. But due to the Indian interference, the nefarious designs and uh, hegemonic ambitions, Indian Ocean region with the flawed thinking of Delhi, that is Indian Ocean as an India's ocean. It becomes a permanent threat, not only for Pakistan, but also <coughs> the littoral states, as well as different powers and different regions which are using Indian Ocean, and it is the lifeline of many countries. To talk on this important subject, we are very fortunate that we have uh, in our studios Vice Admiral Retired Ahmed Saeed, uh, he is the President National Institute of Maritime Affairs. Most welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much for your arrival and thank you very much for your presence in the studios. Sir, sir it's my honor to be here. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you. And uh, 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 Rear Admiral uh, Retired Muazzam Ilyas, he is the very senior officer and having a lot of experience when it comes to the maritime affairs. He is the mar maritime expert, uh, spent his uh, uh, most of the time span in Pakistan Navy. So he is joining us online. Most welcome to you, sir. Thank so, you very uh, much. My first question, uh, uh, Vice Admiral Retired Ahmed Saeed Saab, that uh, just days before, uh, there was an unfortunate incident once again in Mumbai, India. That was a repeat of the past history of the Indian terrorism and whatever we call it uh, piracy. At, at the state-sponsored piracy which is going on in Indian Ocean. And due to that, one of Pakistan bound ships was seized by the Indian authorities, uh, blaming that it might carrying some sort of a nuclear machinery uh, or the machinery which is going to be used in the nuclear uh, uh, different sort of uh, uh, pathways. So uh, Pakistan termed it a dangerous path which India is following right now. How do you see it? Faisal, thank you very much. I think your intro was very comprehensive in terms of outlining importance of we being a maritime nation. Obviously. Our 80% of our uh, uh, shipment plus 90% of our cargo is at sea. So within that, the role of Navy, definitely it is inevitable to have a strong Navy. But at the same time, we are talking about maintaining good order at sea, which is the responsibility uh, responsibility of all the states under the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. So that is where the worry comes into play when India is not only playing a role of uh, disruptive power in the area, consistently they have been doing certain actions which are against the international norms, Obviously it is. as well as the law of the sea. So of late, uh, the incident which you have uh, referred to, that is uh, a ship, uh, Pakistani bound, which had some cargo, uh, which is basically a commercial use cargo, that is a, a computer numerically controlled machine. CNC machines. Yeah. CNC machines, which are used in the auto industry. Obviously. And that is well known. So uh, a kind of, uh, making mountain out of the mole that I would refer to, uh, they have just uh, projected it to be something which can be used in the nuclear uh, ballistic missiles. 
So, I refer it to as if you have you get some uh, nail filer out of somebody and say that he had the intention and it can be used to kill somebody. So, these are the kind of things which they are doing. I think it is and India is keep on repeating its history because it, this is not the one isolated incident. Uh, there are several incident. Uh, number one is that uh, might be some of the cargo ships were uh, seized, uh, uh, some of the um, uh, trawlers or uh, the fishing boats or uh, some, side of, uh, some sort of small uh, ships were dragged from uh, different countries like from Oman, uh, from different countries and then uh, they blamed Pakistan that they were coming to India and they have seized it. So, what kind of uh, the dirty politics going on uh, by India? There is a cyclic uh, systematic uh, incidents. If you see starting from 2005, they had claimed a fishing boat uh, with laden with some uh, explosives close to their Gujarat coast. Yes. And that was exploded and then one of their uh, high ranking officer he claimed that it was a terrorist boat but with their own media uh, their indian express tribune they actually busted that uh, story that it was not a pakistani boat and the same admiral had to come again after one week and accept that that was not the case mm. and that costed him his uh, service also. I think so they have to put more emphasis on their fleet particularly even the submarines and all that which are uh, just capsized or sometimes they drown uh, because of no reasons even in their harbors. So I think so they have to uh, 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 put on some sort of a safety jacket uh, in that particular case rather pointing out fingers towards Pakistan. So uh, now after this incident Indian Defense Minister Rajnath Singh has uh, just given a uh, statement in Goa uh, while uh, inaugurating a naval institute there. Uh, he uh, said that uh, India will not tolerate hegemony or any sort of coercion in Indian Ocean. So what kind of thing, because they are doing that, whatever he is asking, he has to ask this question to uh, the Indian Navy and uh, the state of India rather than just uh, pointing uh, some sort of a statement. Actually, this behavior stems out from the very notion of net security provider in the Indian Ocean. That first it was coined by uh, Robert Kaplan in his book Monsoon. Yeah, yeah definitely. That is where he identified the <coughs> India to be new protege of uh, US. So now they have to actually uh, project themselves, but projecting in a, in a way that they are crafting certain uh, incidents. Like they had crafted one last uh, month close to uh, Somalia, the piracy that we have uh, mm. countered two boats and we have, uh, that was an Iranian boat plus some Pakistani fishermen and they projected it to be an encounter. But the kind of operations they are doing there, it is totally benign. Mm. It is not active uh, participation. So that was actually a drama because none of the Pakistani was traced. None could be correlated with any of the uh, documents. So these kind of things are happening off late. Very rightly you pointed out that they have been forcefully expelled from uh, Maldives merely because of their high headedness and hegemonic designs. Definitely. We will come to that point. Your point well taken. Uh, uh, re uh, Rear Admiral uh, retired Mozum Ilyas Sahib is waiting anxiously to have something in his mind as actually. So uh, Mozum Ilyas Sahib, uh, how do you foresee this uh, Indian Defense Minister's statement and uh, the episode which was happened in Mumbai? Along with that, where are the international bodies, particularly the United, uh, United Nations? Because uh, this uh, UN law of seas is particularly the under the umbrella of United Nations. That is uh, basically envisaging the charter of the United Nations and India is violating each and everything what, what come um, may like uh, the international law, the UN charter, the UN law of seas and whatever that, that is there. So how do you respond to that? Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Faisal, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me in this uh, program. Uh, uh, I, uh, as you as you just asked about this uh, international bodies and everything, 
and i uh, before commenting on that i would like to you know a little dwell upon the incidents that have been happening uh, very recently you can understand that uh, india has recently ratcheted up uh, the uh, the incidents uh, incidents at sea in which there was uh, the fisherman uh, boat which was which they said they have uh, taken out of the custody of hijackers somali pirates and uh, the crew which included pakistani uh, pakistani people they said they have been able to free them from the hostage strike situation and brought them back to their country and then freed them uh, second was probably one of the incident that uh, happened close to the coast of oman uh, they, there was a boat uh, reportedly involved in narco traffic they brought it uh, to the coast of gujarat uh, towed it all the way uh, up to the coast of gujarat and uh, then uh, you know showed up that uh, narcotics is taking a trade is taking place from the coast of pakistan to india which they, have, uh, they had denied it uh, third was the recent incident of uh, seizing this shipment at uh, mumbai port uh, and uh, very lately you might have also seen and read uh, the uh, the claim of uh, taking out the wreckage of our ghazi submarine that was sunk yes definitely that was also uh, yes yeah. that was also a that was also controversy also. and uh, the propaganda which is going on from india yeah before you know we we see what international bodies can do into into these incidents we have to critically analyze what uh, what the indian navy is up to i uh, i see as uh, we go into the critical uh, analysis of these uh, reports or or their uh, actions i see uh, a total utter disregard of the international norms as admiral said has uh, also said Uh, but then the uh, the intent of creating these fabricated stories against pakistan is to malign pakistan at one end and prove that they are uh, able to provide a net security to the to this region uh, despite uh, their uh, you know despite not being able to do things as they claim they can do uh, there are fabricated stories in all these Uh, there are reasons for them to do all this uh, i if i have to dwell upon those reasons i would say that uh, you know the history probably goes back into their uh, genes when they want to be a hegemon in the area uh, on land they have been able to you know overtake or overpower countries uh, which are much smaller in size like myanmar Uh, like uh, you know uh, rear admiral, uh, i would say rear admiral mozam ilya sab uh, uh, now india is building new alliances they are uh, uh, expanding uh, their uh, naval forces into a blue water navy when we are talking about making uh, those designs come true in the into the indian ocean so uh, where pakistan stands now in this all uh, in these all challenges which are right now uh, uh, are there in the indian ocean because of india uh, look uh, as a general rule special i would say that uh, in pakistan uh, the sea board has has been uh, given very low priority in the past uh, our rulers have been more uh, towards the land centric uh, issues the land or border issues towards the contiguous uh, areas uh, of uh, india and afghanistan uh, and uh, you know they they paid very little uh, little attention towards the maritime uh, maritime zone resulting in a lack of uh, improvements lack of development in the maritime domain as well as uh, the pakistan navy itself but uh, lately i think pakistan navy has been very effectively uh, engaged in developing its uh, navy with the latest uh, state of the art ships and vessels uh, with the latest uh, weapons and systems that we acquired some from the western countries and some of them from from china so while we may not be uh, equal or capable uh, it may not be uh, similar to indian navy in in the number of ships that they, that it has number of aircraft number of submarines pakistan navy is a potent force to reckon with uh, in the in the indian ocean in the arabian sea pakistan has been operating alongside Uh, many western navies having those alliances to operate together in improving the 
the combined effort uh, to curtail the maritime security that is uh, that is threatening the international order, uh, and of course operating within a framework of the United Nations and, and international law of the sea. Pakistan. Your point, I, your point uh, well taken. Uh, your point well taken, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Retired Mohsen Milyasab. Uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, Vice Admiral uh, Retired Said Saab, uh, when we are talking about India's second strike capability, and uh, uh, do you think that it's uh, going to destabilize the military balance uh, which is uh, uh, there in past before that uh, capability they have acquired? And has the strategic ramifications for Pakistan particularly, although uh, it's for region as well, but uh, particularly for Pakistan? So we rightly said that... Uh First, we talk of the conventional capability. Uh, as uh, Rear Admiral uh, Elias, uh, uh, he also pointed out that uh, Pakistan Navy is well poised as far as our area of concern. So we have been working hand in gloves with the international communities. Uh, secondly, we have a uh, international working with a lot of nations. That is the reason Pakistan Navy was chosen from here. Definitely into the combined task forces, particularly 150151, yes. But coming towards your question about the uh, second strike capability, surely that is a kind of uh, uh, capability which coupled with the irresponsible behavior of Indian thinkers and maritime practitioners is going to give another destabilizer in this area. Obviously. So the Americans, when they say rebalancing Asia and Pacific, they are actually giving, if a net centric provider role to India, they are actually going to destabilize this. Obviously, region. it is. It so is that is where I think we will have to uh, ratchet up our responses. And uh, uh, as I say, that uh, when the time comes, the especially the military of Pakistan, mm. they have produced a very uh, uh, responsible response in any case. So I'm sure when it comes to the uh, times, so we will have our own response available to them. So uh, but do you not think that pertaining to the Indian and nefarious design and what you are talking about, uh, um, uh, irresponsible behavior of a state and statecraft particularly, even uh, their government and rest of the institutions, they are also behaving irresponsibly. So when such like situation, do you not think that Pakistan must have to acquire some sort of credible and uh, uh, reliable nuclear deterrence when it comes to the sea particularly, uh, Indian Ocean, and uh, Pakistan having that dependable sea-based second strike capability? Do you think that that is inevitable right now? Step one, I would say the... Uh, Admiral Mohsen, as he said, is shift of our frame of thinking from the continental to the seaward side. Yes. That is the first thing. So that in policy domain, we start thinking about it. That was the topic which we had a day before yesterday at international seminar also. It was very well taken. So then comes the second part. Whatever the gaps are available, that we should fill it up. So that is my Definitely, approach. if thinking would be there, then the actions would also be uh, coupled with. So uh, what are your th thoughts that, uh, do you think that overwhelming uh, conventional asymmetric situation, which is between uh, the two naval forces of Pakistan and India, uh, whether we are uh, going in the same way or uh, we are having robust kind of thinking in Pakistan Navy actually? I would say we have a thinking process going on to plug this gap. And uh, uh, nuclear overhang definitely plays a greater role in avoidance of bigger conflicts. Mm. That's what we have thought about. That's what I've been the experience. So that's the reason that we should also have a response available in terms of if the chips are down, mm. definitely. Well, so definitely. there is a gap which needs to be filled up. So your point well taken. Uh, Rear Admiral uh, Mohsen Ilyasab, when we are talking about uh, Pakistan's naval capability, whether we are focusing uh, right now uh, pinpointedly on the surface, subsurface and airstrike capabilities in that mechanism, like having more advanced uh, frigates and destroyers, submarines, and uh, at least we should have uh, some sort of uh, 
latest surface weaponries, uh, having uh, air strike capabilities like squadrons, uh, some sort of fighter jet squadrons and all that, because that is still uh, missing there. Uh, um, right. Faisal, uh, Pakistan Navy has had a very comprehensive developmental strategy since, uh, since inception, I would say. And uh, following that development strategy, Pakistan has been able to, you know, uh, acquire, uh, I would say, latest uh, ships, submarines, and aircraft almost equal in number. Uh, there have been uh, stages in, in this development phase where, uh, where the embargoes and sanctions, they created uh, problems for Pakistan uh, to acquire uh, a particular system. There were embargoes. We could not acquire uh, missiles beyond a particular range under MTCR and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so Pakistan was, uh, in, in some uh, period in the history, was denied a technology that was available otherwise to the uh, other countries and in particular India. Uh, so, but Pakistan has had a, an equal uh, development. Uh, also, uh, in, in the submarine field, I would say, we have had, we have, we now have some top of the line uh, submarines and there are uh, some very good quality submarines coming up in, which are in the pipeline, coming, being constructed in China and being you are talking about uh, acquired class by submarines. Pakistan. Okay. Yes, I'm talking about Angkor class. But uh, equally, or in the aviation part, uh, Pakistan has been able to, uh, to get uh, jet LRMPs and, uh, uh, and UAVs, uh, UCAVs, I would say, uh, where it can have the cap combat capability of engaging uh, a submarine or, for that matter, a surface craft, wherever it, it finds one. So this development has been very uniform in Pakistan, giving equal share uh, to all the arms of the uh, of the navy. However, yes, Kitty is a is a major issue. Our economic situation is uh, is reflective of the development that we are doing in navy, air force, and army. All the three services. Navy, in particular, uh, has not been able to get as much of the uh, Kitty part as it is uh, it wise to as it, as it uh, uh, should have. However, the development has been very uniform. But uh, just to add to the last question that you were uh, that uh, we have was being discussed about uh, the nuclear strike uh, capability, uh, the sea-based second on, strike capability. On. Yeah, I I would say that the nuclear weapons are not for what war fighting in the first place. However, nuclear uh, weapons play a very important role in the war termination strategies and the deterrence. Uh, that uh, one country needs over the other. Uh, second, uh, assured second strike capability only comes at sea. Assured second strike capability. So, it is, uh, there is no second question about Pakistan Navy having to acquire a second strike capability, especially when the Indian Navy has already taken a lead and has based its uh, nuclear weapons or achieved that capability uh, to strike second. Uh, in, in Pakistan, with definitely a, with you are absolutely very right so because uh, when we are, when we have, uh, when India in 1974 there was uh, nuclear ex explosions and uh, afterwards in 1998. Uh, so I think so that afterwards we have developed a land-based deterrence uh, that is reliable, that is uh, uh, very much uh, authentic for the protection and for maintaining peace, particularly into the region, and that is also required in the Indian Ocean now. Uh, uh, when it comes to the seaward uh, and nuclear deterrence. Uh, so, uh, when we are talking about uh, the Western ploy of uh, having uh, upper hand in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, they are uh, keep on maintaining and supporting India to have uh, balance there in Indian Ocean as well, and that's why might be India translated it uh, wrongly. So, uh, these uh, pertaining to these hegemonic designs, do you not think that we should have to rely upon indigenous uh, 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 building because uh, building our navy because uh, we have a very robust Karachi uh, uh, shipyard and engineering works. They are doing excellent job. Along with that, navy has maintained strides uh, over the years uh, because uh, we have maintained like fast attack crafts. We have built submarines in our uh, uh, here with the transfer of technology. We are also working on uh, heavy tankers, uh, heavy tonnage uh, tankers also, and we can. 
work, we are working on Jana class as well with our some of the friends. So, how do you see uh, this aspect? Because why not to rely upon uh, only the procurement from abroad? Uh, you are absolutely right here and to the point, uh, Fasal. And I'll appreciate all your uh, all the knowledge that you have uh, just uh, put in this preamble uh, to the question. I think there is for Pakistan or for a country like Pakistan, there is no second thought other than uh, reliance on the indigenous uh, construction and indigenous production of uh, systems. Uh, Pakistan uh, has been doing it in the past. Uh, Pakistan will continue to do it in future as well. As you said, uh, F-22P, uh, first of the latest or new ships that we acquired uh, from China, uh, there were two or three built in China, but one was built in Pakistan uh, yes. in order to, uh, yeah, in the Karachi shipyard. And then was a tanker, then there was a fast aircraft, OPVs. Belgium Corvettes, uh, Barber class Belgium Corvettes Belgium, as well. Belgium Corvettes. So uh, Pakistan is not stepping back. Pakistan knows the importance of uh, indigenous uh, construction. Karachi shipyard is uh, part and parcel of uh, the maritime developments. Uh, it is not only taking, uh, at currently I would say, it is not only uh, focusing on the naval platforms. It has recently, you might have seen the news item, it has recently signed up for a for constructing a, a merchant ship, a container carrier for Pakistan Navy shipping, uh, PNSC. So I think, uh, I think we uh, should rely on that. It should be the focal uh, direction of our policy. Uh, it has been such. And it will continue in the future. Your point well taken. Um, uh, just uh, your Vice Admiral uh, retired uh, Ahmed Saeed Sahib, uh, uh, would you like to say yeah, something? Just a simple compliment, what uh, I want to say. Okay, please. I think whatever he said is perfectly fine, except one more thing which I would say there is a bottleneck. Bottleneck is one shipyard. We need to have multiple shipyards so that we uh, grow. And we should have, in time and space, we are able to construct more ships. Not only the men of war, but also the... That, uh, that is a very important topic, ships. and we are focusing upon to have another program on that, because that is very important for Pakistan's economy as well. Exactly. So, uh, what about Gawada? Because it is the symbol of prosperity for Pakistan, but uh, uh, most of the adversaries, including India, uh, they are uh, actually trying to disrupt and create instability. Uh, the reason behind destabilization uh, of Balochistan, what you foresee that uh, uh, that is just because uh, of the Indian Ocean, the deep sea port, and Pakistan's uh, uh, desire to have uh, the international trade must have to come to this region. Is it so? Very rightly pointed out. The back end of net security provider is counterbalancing China. So anything and everything which is coming into our area by the name of China, so that has to be stopped, that has to be disrupted, that has to be destabilized. So that is the crux of what is happening. But I'm sure uh, our policy makers, our security forces are working hard and very likely, uh, likely that in coming future, we are coming a big way to stabilize this area and the potential which it will give us to grow, integrate into our economy. And initially, it was uh, taken as about 70 billion per year if it comes into full fledged operations. What, whatever was envisaged, actually. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Vice Admiral retired uh, MS Hesab, uh, international media reports suggest that India building radar arrays at different uh, uh, free places uh, in Bangladesh, uh, in Maldives. Recently, they have uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, state to state uh, disconnect and uh, then Sri Lanka, a full-fledged base in Agaliga Islands uh, that is there in Mauritius, availing port and dry uh, docking facilities at Tukum in uh, Oman, and uh, then uh, have, uh, have stakes. They are trying to, still they are trying to uh, develop some stakes there in Chahabar, Iran. So do you not think that uh, it is, uh, we are focusing a lot towards east, but what about south? Because India is encircling, it's kind of encircling Pakistan. Very rightly pointed out. In maritime domain, if you want to have stability, this is one of the key factors on which Pakistan should invest. Like giving you an uh, example, uh, USA at the moment has around 800 bases around the globe from where they have the eyes, ears and control their interests. 
So, similarly, the areas where we have our maritime interest, we need to invest, we need to come to these areas and we need to have the basis or at least we should have a bilateral agreement with them, so as to get those information and kind of security we are looking at. So, whether we are there in Djibouti, but diplomatically or uh, uh, militarily, uh, militarily might be not there, but uh, why not diplomatically? Yeah, sure. There are, we have had a lot of influence in the Gulf from the maritime side, but of late I think we have given up that space whereby now another, uh, the other countries have started taking place. So, that is a policy decision I think at the political level that our strategic direction in maritime domain needs to be corrected and accordingly then we should be given the directions to have uh, these kind of relations. We do have a bilateral relations with all the countries of the region like Maldives, like Sri Lanka. We have a very cordial relations and of course, we are exploiting to our interest. Your point well taken, I must say. Sir, but, uh, when we are talking about Indian hegemony and uh, it is building a naval strength in the Indian Ocean, uh, how do you envisage uh, particularly uh, the Pakistan's uh, trade shipping uh, that is uh, invisible uh, approximately uh, in the Indian Ocean and how our trade is vulnerable because of uh, uh, the non-presence of our own oil tankers and bulk carriers into the sea. If we recollect uh, our national security policy 2022, in that <coughs> we had cate categorized the uh, national economy to be the synonym to national security. Mm. So, if that be the case then that has to be given the priority and it is all tentacles including the maritime economy has to be integrated. So, one of the factor which you are talking about the our uh, merchant marine fleet and its capacity and capability of course, it is not at par. In 1971, when uh, at that time when we made the nationalization decisions uh, after that, we had around uh, 75 sh ships at that time of which 39s were from the private sector. Obviously. So, from then onwards once we nationalized the all the big players they went out, now they are operating the ships outside not in Pakistan. So, Pakistan is reduced to 13 ships, 12 or 13 at the Definitely moment. Definitely nationalization has also damaged this cause because uh, uh, merchant marine ships and uh, shipping is uh, a very vital segment. Pakistan can earn, earn billions of dollars out of that, but e now right now our exchequer is actually paying those billions of dollars to international community. Very rightly pointed out sir for the reasons that are uh, at the moment around uh, 80 to 90 billion is the sea bond trade export and export of which we are only uh, our flag carriers are taking up 10 percent of that. Mm. That means rest of the money the freight charges we are giving to the other shipping and that too in foreign currency. If we have our own ships which normally every country should have we should have around 80 to 90 ships plying at sea. So, that entire in and out of our bulk cargo liquids everything is taken care by our own country. So, this about 10 billion we can save. You are absolutely right and thank you very much uh, Vice Admiral Retired Ahmed Said sahab for being here in the studios and well elaborated thoughts. Thank you very much for that. So nice of it's you. It is my pleasure. Uh, uh, Rear Admiral Retired uh, Mohsam Ilyas sahab, uh, when we are talking about India's interventions and whatever the threats created into the Indian Ocean right now. India's uh, growing maritime hegemonic architecture uh, with uh, rising long range uh, reconnaissance, anti submarine, and also anti surface warfare, intelligence gathering networks and missions, which are uh, now uh, uh, portable because of uh, uh, some of the offshore uh, naval bases, like in uh, Mauritius and uh, some of the other uh, areas in which uh, India is looking for. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, what has happened during the past about a decade or so, where India uh, has become a, uh, you know, star for uh, the Western world, where it has uh, gained importance uh, for the West, uh, not because India per se was uh, too good to uh, make, to befriend. It was uh, primarily because the Chinese influence in the region was gaining uh, you know, significantly and China 
uh, was uh, determined to make uh, keep its key lines of communication open, especially those which are operating to the Indian Ocean, because uh, they, they were the lifeline for Chinese industry. Uh, and to keep those sea lines of communication and those maritime interests uh, within their control, they started deploying their uh, their naval units in this area. And uh, it did not augur well, very well with the Western world, especially the United States, which uh, was, uh, until a particular time, the dominant player, the dominant force, in the Indian Ocean, with its uh, um, Indo-Pacific Command and Central Command uh, looking after this area, they were the dominant force. Uh, so they, again, uh, you know, uh, took this uh, India, or Indian Navy for that matter, to become and play the role of a strategic leverage against China. It is with that, with that background that India is expanding its bases getting that technology cutting edge technology from the from the west again especially from the united states and uh, you know making its navy very uh, very potent uh, out of a simple coastal navy to a blue water navy uh, so i personally feel that uh, while india is doing it at the behest or in order to suit the uh, maritime interests of the greater powers in this area uh, it is actually helping its own hegemony or hegemonic design uh, suitable for uh, this development as well. Your point, uh, your point well taken, uh, Mohsen Ilyasab. Uh, uh, viewers here, we also uh, introduce you um, our next guest uh, who is the, here in studios, uh, Tanvir Sultan Awan Sahib. Uh, he is the geopolitical analyst and uh, uh, most welcome to you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Being here in the studios. Thank you very much for your arrival. Uh, uh, when we are uh, we were talking about uh, how India is uh, actually gaining in uh, Indian Ocean, and uh, because of the Western support, particularly the United States, uh, the net security provider, something so called, and uh, uh, whatever they are thinking, and they have a flawed thinking like Indian Ocean is like India's ocean. And when we are talking about their the facilities in might be in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, then Maldives, then Mauritius, then having Oman, and then uh, uh, g gaining something in uh, Chabar as well. It's kind of en encircling, so uh, uh, encircling Pakistan. So how do you see after the Eastern Front, in the Western Front in Afghanistan, and then having some sort of uh, that thing in South, India is trying to um, uh, tightly encircle Pakistan, damaging its economy from the day first, like uh, FATF and all other things, and now in Indian Ocean. How do you envisage? Thank you very much, Fazal, for, for having me over. Okay, we'll see this thing uh, in a global perspective, and then we'll come to India and Pakistan also. You see, it's a changing world. When it comes to India and Pakistan, we have our challenges on the eastern border and as well as on the southern border. And uh, nobody should mince any words. India has very deliberate ill intentions about Pakistan, to which we are very much cognizant about it. And our defense capability and our defense forces, including Navy, Army, Air Force, they are well uh, taken care of uh, these challenges. Now, the changing global situation in which there are some international scenarios which must be also taken into consideration mm. because of which India happens to be a beneficiary of that situation. For example, uh, where Pakistan is located, we are in the very close neighborhood where more than 50 percent of the hydrocarbon uh, global resources are placed. Mm. Just the state of Homer's alone, 20 percent of the global oil the passage is through the state of Homer's, and Obviously. Pakistan is right mm. at the choke point of that area. Obviously. So Pakistan itself now, uh, with the new addition of CPAC, this again has raised another concern in the region. Now, United States of America, uh, uh, people say generally that in the, um, uh, uh, when it comes to strategic considerations, mm. um, all wars are basically fought for bigger markets, for economic gains. United States of America has enjoyed a monopoly of over four decades on the, uh, you, uh, I mean, sim simple ter terminology is petrodollar. Mm. Okay. Mm. Ever That's since the um, Ukraine war, this situation has changed and changed significantly. For example, people are uh, uh, considering to make trade in rubles. Saudi Arabia, the strongest US ally and partner, uh, is considering to do trade in yuan and Saudi Rial. 
Definitely, so this is a changing currency world. swaps right. are going on everywhere. So now. when we take all this into consideration, automatically we come to the rim. The both um, the, uh, the if you talk of the closer proximity of Pakistan, our coast, mm. the Gulf Persian Gulf, our uh, exclusive economic uh, zone, which is almost like 297 kilometers, which is a part of our jurisdiction. Obviously, it and is. obviously we can't keep a close eye to what's happening. Now, United States itself entered into three agreements of satellite communication and logistic support and technical agreements with India. Not limited to that, they entered into about four different agreements with Australia, New Zealand, Australia, UK, um, uh, USA. When you put all these dots together, an image emerges out of that. Mm. All this is basically to cordon China. To contain China. To contain it's China, because yes. because of the containment of yes. China policy. Now, India happens to be a beneficiary of that situation when it comes to this relationship. Obviously, very uh, uh, you just said about a while ago that even the name has been changed from Asian Pacific to Indo-Pacific. Yes. You know, yes. all these terminologies. Mm. So, this sends a message. So, all this put together, definitely, Pakistan has a very serious concern about so, all uh, this. So, uh, when you are talking about on that aspect, Tanvir Sultan, sir, uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, what do you think that there is a notion uh, that... Uh, uh, whether it's true or not, uh, you can explain it, that soon after the rise of uh, the CPAC, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and Gawadar being the central point okay. and uh, going to be a symbol of prosperity for Pakistan, there is a rise of terrorism, extremism, and uh, insurgency in Pakistan, especially in Balochistan. Balochistan is the uh, focus of all... Uh, um, adversaries. Uh, I am not talking about India, but I am talking about others as well. So, do you think so that it's happening because of that? And now, in Indian Ocean, that is coupled with the same policy. This, this is also a, in addition to all what you have mentioned. This is also a component and a factor. For example, let's look at the larger picture. China heavily relies on its export. I mean, that's where they are the yes, yes. second largest economy Obviously. in the world today. Maybe the first, I would say, but uh, since it's been acknowledged to the second largest. Now, all their trade through the uh, Pacific and the Indian Ocean is mm. through the Korean Peninsula and the Red China Sea. C correct? Definitely. We know that Red China Sea is under very serious threat because of the Taiwan issue. Yes, okay. it is. Now, for China, why I'm saying is that it's not only Pakistan. China has much more than economic interest as per my humble understanding as far as CPAC is concerned. No doubt about that it. That yes. in case if there's a disturbance uh, anywhere in the Pacific or in the Indian Ocean, China practically is a landlocked country. Yes. Unless pa China has China this alternative wants an route. alternative route. Right. Thank Definitely. you. So now, uh, see now the clear picture is emerging very clear. Thank you for putting this question. All this is encircling very well out. Now you see there's a very definite design like I said earlier. Eventually it is for China. Mm. And we being a Chinese ally, obviously, there's a price to it, definitely. Like you mentioned about the terrorist activities, the insurgencies in Balochistan, etc., etc. All this doesn't favor to those school of thoughts which are already working against China. But uh, likewise, we said earlier that it is a matter of very serious, uh, I wouldn't say threat as of now, but a matter of very serious uh, concern, concern for us yes. to be cognizant and we must align our policies accordingly. Hmm, definitely, your point well taken. Uh, um, Rear Admiral uh, retired uh, Mohsam Ilyas, sir, uh, when we are talking yes. about uh, uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association, unfortunately from the last many decades, Pakistan is missing uh, uh, out of that uh, association. And what's the core reason of that? Is it India only or uh, uh, there is any other reason as well? Um, um, all right, uh, Faisal, before answering your, uh, your question, let me uh, just add a little bit to the previous question about Gawadar. Why not? Uh, and while you very rightly pointed out that there are there are countries, there are forces, which are uh, not specific to India, but other uh, others in the region and beyond, who do not want the, this port city of Gawadar to expand and to come to its full potential, uh, I I think that uh, the prime reason, the prime factor in that, is India, and uh, I will not hesitate in saying. Uh, that they they're, that they have been totally uh, against the idea of developing Gawadar uh, and uh, bringing it to its full potential because it can provide it has enormous potential. That uh, that said, uh, with the CPEC, Gawadar uh, took a, a, an additional importance and it automatically came as a as a very important port because 
it provided a maritime terminus to that uh, Belt and Road Initiative to China uh, to come to Gavadar. And uh, to thwart these uh, developments, India had been supporting Iran to renovate and to build up uh, Jabhar port so that uh, Jabhar could uh, threaten or could challenge the actual development of Gavadar. So that uh, part I thought uh, was missing and I wanted to bring it to your uh, discussion also. Uh, coming over to this Indian Ocean uh, Rim State and Association, uh, Pakistan ha has not been participating as effectively as uh, it should, uh, mainly because uh, uh, because Pakistan thought that uh, this uh, association was uh, was comprising countries which do not have enough of potential to uh, to police or to control the Indian Ocean. Now I start talking about uh, the countries that that are on the uh, Indian Ocean Rim. Except for Pakistan and India, the navies of these countries are very limited. They are literal in their uh, literal navies in their nature. Uh, they were unable to uh, control high seas. They were unable to uh, control those maritime threats which uh, were not only endangering their own maritime interests but also of the international. Uh, but of international concerns, like, for example, sir, piracy. Your, your point well taken, sir. Your point well taken. Uh, thank you very much for being with us online, uh, Rear Admiral, uh, retired Mohazam Ilya, sir. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Well thank elaborated. You, uh, thank you, uh, When we are talking about uh, uh, Tanvir, sir, uh, related to that, uh, how much we have strengthened uh, our uh, trade overall and uh, what are the significant uh, uh, hiccups and hurdles which are emerging from India, uh, do you think that because of Indian designs, do we have in future the more liberty at sea available and uh, having the secure sea lines and uh, ports which are vital, having, uh, vital to have a smooth uh, trade uh, during extreme circumstances particularly? Sassan sir, um, obviously we know India's intention about Pakistan, but I think more important is for us to put our house in order first. We have been missing such phenomenal and tremendous opportunities. You see, there's another very important way of countering all these mm. is uh, uh, increasing trade with the neighboring countries. You intensify your interests. That's another, you dilute uh, others' intentions because there's, uh, there, there, there are more people, more stakeholders uh, in, in a situation like this. Mm. Saudi Arabia wanted to put uh, oil refinery in Gawadar. Because of us, we could not. So in our in-house issue, consistent of policies, political stability, all this leads not only to these challenges, but also there's a lot to do with the image of a country also, how others perceive about us. So I think it's, it's about time. We have these opportunities. Means they we have to maintain our own li Literally in our lap, mm. but we have to be able to encash these opportunities. Mm. I'm very confident that if we can uh, pull our socks up and if we can really manage ourselves well, all these other challenges would, I wouldn't say they'll diminish, but they'll definitely dilute. So do you think that India is now acting as a bad cop in uh, uh, Indian Ocean and they are bringing that state piracy uh, type of thing into the uh, Indian Ocean along with that, uh, that fascism which was uh, the land centric, now they are shifting it to the Indian Ocean? You see, if you talk of Indian uh, illicit trade, for example, India was almost given the status of a narco state. Twenty million dollar worth of uh, narcotics were seized by some, I think, U.S. vessels under the missile vessel, and over nine hundred million dollar worth of drugs have been confiscated in the region in a year's time in 2022, and all the links eventually converged to India and some of the other countries. So India, I mean, the, but yet you see the way they are being patronized in the region because of the commonality of interest, because the bigger enemy and the target is China end of the day. And if you have some sort of a brief uh, re response that uh, West wants India to be a net security pro provider, there is no security in the Indian Ocean right now because of India. So do you think that if uh, China comes to have a security provider into the Indian Ocean, there would be a complete insecurity into the Indian Ocean? You see, when you say a security provider, uh, there are various ways to look at it. First of all, uh, what you have mentioned is it will be an excellent teamwork, but this is exactly opposite to what they intend to do. They mm. want to contain China. Obviously. They, they want to contain China. 
they do not want China to have this kind of monopoly into the Indian or uh, Indian Pacific rim, no not at all, it is certainly against their policy. So, this is where exactly India becomes beneficiary of this situation. Obviously, obviously. Thank you very much, uh, Tanvir Sultan Awan sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your time, for your candid views, and being here into the thank studios. You. Thank you very thank much. Thank sir. you so for nice having me. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, viewers, as our uh, guests and uh, uh, speakers, they have uh, loudly said that it is important that you, we have to make our house in order and. Uh, now, as we have a new government in Pakistan, and uh, we pray that, that this government must have to be strengthened, uh, government must have to look uh, outward now and uh, em put more emphasis on the maritime affairs, uh, particularly to build a robust, active, and very uh, advanced, strong navy. Put emphasis on that. We have to uh, put emphasis on uh, the maritime merchant shipping, because that is the uh, lifeline for Pakistan. Pa we have to enhance our shipping. We have to acquire more bulk carriers and oil tankers as well if we want to have free and fair trade into the Indian Ocean. We have to look into the security dilemma which is emerging in the Indian Ocean because of India and we have to ri raise this issue internationally even into the international organizations as well. We have to develop Gawada. Fears are uh, minimal because uh, if threats are there, threats are, would also uh, always be there but we have to go on as a robust and resilient nation and also not only for Pakistan but uh, for the whole of the Indian Ocean region it's important that the world the freedom of navigation that is very important and throughout this territory uh, it is important for energy security and also resultantly for economic prosperity when it comes to trade and all others this is today's foresight it's time to sign off Allah Hafiz. <laughs>